Okay, so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have the pleasure to hear Florian Girilli from University of Waterloo, and he will tell us about uh, higher gauge theory and quantum gravity. Please. Are you recording or? Yeah. It's recording now? Yeah. Oh, okay, I didn't, I didn't get the, uh, the thing. Okay. All right, good morning or good, mo uh, good afternoon or good morning everyone. Um, so I would like to talk today uh, about some work that is uh, in preparation. Actually, it's kind of uh, more or less finished and uh, uh, we should put it out uh, very soon. Uh, some work done in collaboration with uh, Matteo and Peter, um, who, are, who are PhD students. And so also I would like to thank um, uh, Mark and Etera for inviting me to, to speak uh, here. So, what is the plan of, um, of this talk? So first, uh, some questions will be asked. A secret will be re uh, revealed, and hopefully some uh, lessons uh, will be learned. So let's start with uh, some questions. Uh, maybe the one, so it's, the questions are not really ordered, it's uh, various questions. So the first question is, um, how can we define the notion of length? So we know that in the uh, loop quantum gravity approach, uh, we work with the flux. The flux is kind of the object encoding the gravitational degrees of freedom. And it's a bivector. So, um, you know, we, we, we would like to try to reconstruct the notion of length. After all, you know, if we want to do a gravity, it's about, you know, the metric and so on. It's actually quite complicated to reconstruct the notion of length using a bivector, obviously. And so Eugenio proposed uh, some formalism, but it's quite complicated. And also it's, it's so complicated that I think it's kind of uh, actually uh, difficult to, or probably difficult to generalize to the curve case. Um, a paper that actually Daniele Oriti pointed out to us last week uh, by uh, Louis Crane and Yeter um, discuss that, you know, if we do spin forms, um, it would be better maybe to have also some decoration or some, to have some length information on the, uh, in the spin form, maybe to try to assess whether, you know, some uh, geometries are degenerate or, or not. So, you know, what, how can we, maybe there exist a notion, uh, a representation, which would be relevant for the quantum gravity regime, where the notion of length is more, uh, more available, easier to get. Uh, the second notion is how do we define the notion of curved geometry? And here by curved, I mean uh, with a cosmological constant, so homogene uh, homogeneously curved, like inputting the cosmological constant. So uh, Hal and um, Aldo and uh, Bushin and, and Wojciech proposed a construction and essentially what they were doing is that they were um, uh, curving the phase space, the only flux uh, phase space, um, and so they were curving the flux, the flux um, to, to, you know, to encode this notion of curvature. On the other hand, there exists this uh, argument by Hilt, uh, Ekman and Hilton, which says the following. Let's say that we put some uh, group decoration on a face, you know, like the flux would be. Then uh, I can, you know, I can consider this uh, big face with three uh, subfaces, and then I can compose them. And these things, you know, that is geometrically consistent. So I should compose, I can compose them. First, let's say I can compose them horizontally, like these two guys, and then vertically. And that's what I would get. Or I can also proceed in the other way. I can, I can first uh, compose them vertically, like that, okay, and then uh, horizontally. And if you do so, then you compare the results that you get, and you see that essentially the group has to be abelian. So, you know, what's going on? How can it be consistent um, with this kind of structure? And I will come back to, to that. So what I just want, I want to say here is that it seems to me that just through this argument, decorating uh, faces with non abelian group elements is kind of, uh, uh, you know, seems to be tricky in a way. Also, um, since we usually build like the spin four models uh, using a topological theory, you know, we, if we want to do 4D uh, gravity, you know, we should maybe, uh, you know, we want to probe like stuff about 4D topology. 
but it is it is known that you know 4D topology is, is not formed by categories. Categories form better, you know, the 3D topology uh, for 3D space time. Instead, we should uh, deal at least with two categories, and so, and by that I mean that we should deal with uh, with a complex which is which has decoration both on the links and the faces. Um, and um, you know, usually we deal with spin networks which have just decorations on the on the links. If you talk also about a particle, so a particle, you, you know, it's an object that you probe with just a, um, a loop in the two, pl two plus one case, but in a three plus one case, you want really to have a two lunomy. So you like to have a, uh, you know, some kind of information on the face. Again, uh, obviously you have you have uh, the bivector, which maybe could provide such uh, such a thing, but you know. What, I'm, what I want to point is that maybe we should have, uh, uh, we should be using more uh, complex, which has not only decoration on the links, but also on the faces. So these uh, three questions can have uh, um, not an answer, uh, not a final answer, I would say, but uh, you know, some, all these questions can be uh, very well addressed using two groups. Um, and so what is a two group? Uh, so you know, a group can be seen some kind of as some kind of holonomy. So if I got a group, you can say you know a group is going to parallel transport the information I've got here to this point here, right? And what I can do then, if I'm going to to deal with a two group, is that I'm going to also have a decoration on the face with a group here, and I want to have something that makes sense. I, I want to I get a consistent framework for that. So let's talk about these two groups. So I'm going to talk about what is called strict two groups. There is a weaker notion of two groups, but um, I'm not working uh, with that yet. Um, so what is a, a two group for me? A two group is what uh, people also call a cross module. So it's a pair of groups and the map, the T map, is, which is a nomomorphism. So it's a map that goes from H to G and an action. So that's a math uh, definition. What's um, what's a concrete um, uh, concrete uh, concrete meaning of these guys? So here H is going to decorate uh, the faces, and G are decorating the edges, the links, the path. Um, so uh, you know the H is going to transport this G1. Intuitively, we say that G, uh, H is going to transport G1 to uh, G2. Since H uh, and G are in different groups, you know, they need to talk to each other. And that's achieved by the team up. The team up allows, you know, to make these two guys uh, talking together. And so then we're going to say that G2 is going to be G1. And so we're going to have the H information is going to be here through this team up. So the team up is kind of what the, the thing connecting G and H. Um, what about the action? Well, you see that in fact, um, my path here are starting from a root. And so when I define a face, it means that essentially I still have a root. And so a face will be always rooted. And then what you can do is to, you can change the root. If you change the root of, you know, I, I can I could say that's my root. I could say maybe that's my root here, or I could put the root here. And changing the root, you know, is just achieved by um, a normal holonomy like G, right? So I'm going to move this guy up here through a, a path uh, decorated by a group element G. And so uh, this means that the H is going to change root. And so I need uh, for that an action of the group G on, uh, on the face decoration. So that's, um, um, that's kind of the concrete practical um, meaning of these two group stuff. So then it's a two group. So it happens that there are two products. There is a vertical product. So the, there is, uh, yeah, it's a vertical product. And then there is the horizontal product. And you see that in the horizontal product, you see that I want to multiply this guy with this guy, but you see that this guy and this guy, H and H prime, they don't have the same root, right? H prime is rooted, uh, is rooted here, whereas this guy is rooted here. So to multiply them, they need to have the same root. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to parallel transport essentially the roots of this guy over there, and then I'm going to be able to do the multiplication. So that's why, you know, that's how this action pops up. Uh, in this case, we see that uh, these two H and H prime are the same root, so I can actually multiply them. What's very important is that 
to this map, the T map and the action, they need to satisfy some consistency relation. And so that, those are kind of the consistency relation. And with this consistency relation, we can evade the Hickman Hilton argument. So now I can multiply, you know, things. Uh, I can redo my uh, decorate my, my little square that I was doing before. And I can compose the faces and it's going to be fine. I'm going to, I don't need to have something abelian. So what was missing in a way uh, for the squares before was that I needed to have some edge decoration as well. Okay. And in fact, I was talking with Aldo, uh, but you know, I was telling you the other day, I was talking with Aldo saying, oh, but how come you, do, how come you evade the Hickman Newton argument? And I was saying, oh yeah, that's probably because underlying we're kind of assuming there is some edge decoration that we are really not really mentioning. So the details of that have to be found out, but probably that's, that's kind of the idea of why obviously is uh, their construction is still uh, working. So let me give some examples. Um, uh, a, a group is going to be a trivial example of a two group, right? So since I have uh, a group G and a group H, I can just freeze one of the two. So I can freeze the group H, okay? And then I just deal with G and we'll see then everything here is going to be trivial. Or I can also freeze G, okay? So I just get uh, nothing here and then I just get uh, like a decoration of the face. The point is that when the T-map is trivial, um, if you see that the T-map is trivial, you see it from here, right? If you check that uh, the compatibility between the action and the T-map, uh, you can say that if the T-map is one, is trivial, then you, you, you have the relation that uh, H and H prime must be commutative, so that's an abelian group. So um, having a trivial T-map, meaning it's just one, always it's constant, it's one, this means that the group, the phase decoration has to be abelian. And it also implies that uh, the vertical product that we are defining is kind of not so far away from um, uh, the horizontal product. So in a way, when we deal with T-maps which are trivial, a two group, you know, from a practical perspective, a mathematician probably will not agree, but for, for us, for practical purposes, in a way, this, uh, this two group is not far from being a group. And I'm going to, we're going to see that uh, later on. So these are the trivial uh, examples. Now, uh, there are more uh, interesting examples, uh, still with a trivial T-map. So in this case, we have like the point carry type two group. For example, we have SO31 on R4, acting on R4. So SO31 would be on the edges, R4 on the faces. It's abelian, right? Uh, it's a trivial T-map, which is just the action of SO31 group on R4. And then we can also deal with the Lie algebra or the, 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 the dual of the Lie algebra. And then again, because this guy, so we see the Lie algebra as an abelian group. And so again, then this means the T map has to be trivial and the action just the action of G on this Lie algebra or um, dual Lie algebra. Another example is when you say that H is the same as G. And so then the T map is non trivial in this case. And the T map is going to be just uh, one. So uh, the identity better. And so the action is just like the adjoint action. So these are uh, typical examples. We can then take the infinitesimal limit uh, for these, uh, these groups and go to an, like a differential cross module, it's called, or an, infi uh, an infinitesimal cross module. And so instead of dealing with groups, we deal with uh, Lie algebras. And so essentially we take the D for physicists. Uh, we take the D of that and, uh, and that's, that's basically it. So then we you know, deal with the Poincaré. Uh, I was listing again the examples here. We are still have the Poincaré Lie to algebra. So now it's the algebra there. The T-map is just zero here, it's constant. Um, and then we have the inner automorphism uh, two um, algebra, which is given again by uh, two copies of G. So that's, I think, pretty straightforward. If we have the algebra, then we can discuss uh, uh, two gauge theory. So now what I'm gonna have is that I'm gonna have um, a one connection Okay, which is a normal connection, the usual uh, gauge connection that we are used to. This is a guy that is going to live on the, on the path. And then we're going to have the two connection. It's a two form with value in H. And that's going to be the guy, you know, is going to transport, uh, I mean, practically for us, it's kind of the guy that is going to transport this, um, the, uh, the path in a way. So um, 
uh, then we have the notion of curvature, you know, the curvature, the one curvature. But then you remember that we had the notion that we said that, you know, if you have a decoration like that with G1 here and then uh, G2 here and then H, then we had that T of H is essentially equal to G2, G1 minus one. So if you go to the infinitesimal limit of that, so it means that tau of sigma is just going to be, and this is the autonomy, right, on, on, on loop, so it's going to be some, something like that. So this means that we need to have this type of uh, property. So the f is kind of connected to the, to the sigma. If tau is zero, then it just means it has to be flat. Um, so, okay, so that's curvature is kind of connected to uh, the two connection through the tau, the tau math. And then we can also define the two curvature, so the curvature for the two connection, which is a free form, and that's just the, uh, the covariant derivative of um, the two connection. So we can also then define the notion of uh, gauge transformations. So we have the usual notion of gauge transformation, and then it can be supplemented by some kind of extra term um, that, com that is coming from the uh, the two gauge um, from the two, yeah, the two group uh, perspective. And we also have uh, two, uh, you know, gauge transformation for the, for the two form, for the two connection. So, uh, now with that, let's talk about actions. Which, uh, which type of action uh, have such two group symmetries? And I'm gonna talk about 4D. We could maybe also have a discussion about 3D, but today, I'm just going to talk about 4D. So obviously there is um, the, the BF type theory, so 4D BF theory, where we deal with um, um, some, uh, you know, some whatever the algebra you want here. And so you have the equation of motion, and then you know that the symmetries of this guy are basically the, uh, the normal gauge transformations, and we have the translational symmetry, and this translational symmetry can be interpreted as a two gauge. So here, here the two connection will be the B field. Uh, so the group, which is associated with that, is the tangent to group, okay, where basically we, uh, we have SO that would act on this uh, Lie algebra. So RD is like the Lie algebra of, um, of um, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, D is a dimension of, um, of the algebra that we're dealing with here. Then we can um, uh, talk about uh, this action where you put a cosmological constant. And uh, in this case, you know, we have uh, again some gauge transformation, but then we are, you are, you have kind of an extra term. You have also the two gauge transformations. Sorry, no, there is no extra term. That's my. Um, yeah, so we have the one gauge transformation and we also have the two gauge transformations, which are, so we have a, also a natural way to realize the two gauge um, uh, symmetry in this context. And this uh, two group, as argued by Baez, is basically given by the inner automorphism uh, two group. I wanted to point, to put out also some text that uh, is also in this, uh, in this review, where he's pointing out that this type of action, you know, um, is usually said to correspond to generate to the craniator model where you put, you know, um, um, a, you know, it's like a spin form with a category of representation of the quantum group associated to G here. And he says that in some circles, this is taken almost as an article of faith. And so, uh, you know, that's what I wanted to mention that to this, uh, to this audience. And so he's saying that actually there is no real, real, uh, um, a fully convincing argument, and so that you know, should this should be studied more uh, uh, more carefully. So this is uh, two type of actions. Then there is a third action, which is kind of my uh, my baby action. So that's an action I introduced back in the days, and that's really like uh, this is an action that would be good for any type of uh, two group. And uh, I know, Mark, we talked at some point, we, we, we tried to see whether we could add possibly some more terms, like some BB terms or things like that. Uh, but so this is an action which is really based on, you know, any type of two, um, two group um, symmetry. So now it's time to tell you the secret. What is the secret? There are more uh, two-gauge structures in 4DBF theories. 
And so to uh, understand what's going on here, I want to do uh, two things. First, I'm going to do some analogy. I'm going to go back to 3D, and then I'm going to show you, uh, discuss some uh, specific examples in 4D. So let's get back to 3D uh, gravity. First, let's discuss the case of uh, no cosmological constant. Okay, so there are uh, different ways to formulate the theory. You can deal with Chan Simon, or there we are going to deal with a full set of symmetries at once. Okay, so that's a Poincare symmetry. Or what you can do is that you can say, oh no, in fact, what I want to do is that I'm going to choose a polarization. I'm going to say I'm going to pick, for example, the connection as my configuration. And then, beam, you, you really restrict to LQG. Or you can do the other way around. You can say, oh, in fact, I'm going to, fig I'm going to really work with uh, the, the, the triad, of the frame field as my um, configuration um, variable. And in this case, you get the dual uh, LQG, or which is also called, uh, like, which is also um, called like the uh, BF vacuum and things like that, that uh, Mark and uh, Bianca introduced. So um, what, I to, what, I, what I would like to emphasize is that uh, in, we can deal in the St. Simon picture, we deal with the full thing at once, but then in this other approaches, we break it down. And so we say, oh, look, we're going to break this guy into two uh, gauge theories, a pair of gauge theories, of normal gauge theories, and we're going to discretize them on, you know, on the, on the complex. So the configuration variable is going to go on the complex, okay? Where the momentum variables are going to be discretized essentially on the on the triangulation. And so, um, so this is a gauge theory, you see, where you say, oh, that's a gauge theory in A, I got my curvature. But then here also I have a gauge theory in E for the uh, for this um, triangulation. But you notice that even though it's kind of a gauge theory on E, there is still some A. And this is due to the fact that we are dealing with, you know, ISO3, so there is an action of SO3 on the translation sector. And so we could also do the opposite way. And so then we would deal with E, kind of the frame field discretized on, on, the, um, on, the, on the complex here. And the connection would be discretized on the triangulation uh, instead. This also works uh, when you put a cosmological constant. In this case, we take uh, some, I'm taking the case of Euclidean gravity with a negative cosmological constant. So I'm going to deal with SL2C. And SL2C can be decomposed in, the, in terms of the Iwasawa decomposition. So we have SU2 and AN2. And once again, you know, we can deal with the full package at once, like in Chan Simon, or we can untangle the things. We can deal with SU2 and AN. And once again, now we can deal with a pair of gauge theories, one on the complex, one on the triangulation. But the thing is that because we have this both tie, so SU2 acts on AN and AN acts back, right, kicks back, uh, we have kind of a mix. And so even though it's kind of a gauge theory on the, co on the complex in A, there is also some E. And, uh, and similarly for the triangulation, there is some E, so some E's here, but there is also some A. Okay, so in this case, when you deal with this type of uh, uh, bow tie, then everything becomes symmetric. And when you discretize that, that's how you get the quantum group uh, type structure that, um, uh, that people uh, know well. So um, I wanted also to say things maybe in a, in a different way. So when we uh, do this uh, construction, we say, you know, I'm going to say, I'm going to fix my configuration variable here, I'm saying it's A. And when I discretize, uh, I'm going to discretize it on the, on the complex. And whereas the momentum variable, I'm going to discretize it on the, on the triangulation. And this is kind of uh, breaking the symmetry, you know, what you call X or P is not, is not, you know, it's just a matter of what you call. But then when you discretize, you're really assigning things, structures to, uh, you know, either the triangulation or the complex. So you're kind of breaking this kind of, um, uh, you're kind of breaking this equivalence between, you know, X, P, it's kind of the same guy. Um, and so at the end of the day, this, this is important because um, the charge that is generating the symmetries is essentially here a phase space variable. And so when you fix, um, you know, and say, oh, I'm going to use this guy as configuration, then it means that, you know, you're choosing a polarization to build your quantum states. And this implies that you're going to have a choice of uh, symmetries. And that's why then, uh, if you choose, for example, the connection A to be uh, your, um, 
uh, your uh, configuration variable, then the momentum variable being discretized on the triangulation, you know, you have to satisfy some um, some geometric conditions, and that's why you're going to get the Gauss constraint. So the Gauss constraint is going to be the guy that's going to tell you the charges, you know, or, sorry, the symmetries of the theory. Um, yeah. So what happens now in 4D? So let's deal with 4D BF. Uh, and I'm going to deal with uh, such uh, the algebra. So it's the B and the, the B, the B uh, so the connection is going to be with value in such uh, the algebra. So it's like a Poincaré type uh, the algebra. So I deal with, you know, I can deal with the BF and that's what, you know, you deal usually. Or what I can do is that I can, I can, I can actually split it up. That's the thing I was telling you before with Chan Simon. What we, we, what we can do is that we can break up Poincaré into pieces. And that's what I want to do here. So if we did with this guy, I'm going to break it up. And so I'm going to have, I put an E here. I mean, because if you're dealing with uh, 4D, I mean, E is typically the frame field, but obviously if you, it's, it doesn't have to be the frame field. It can be just a, a one form. Uh, but it's just an abuse of notation. So then the, the connection, sorry, the curvature is going to be, you know, like uh, F, the curvature of A plus uh, this piece, uh, plus like a torsion-like uh, guy. And the B field is, is, is in the dual. And so also, I can also decompose it like that. And so that's how I can decompose my, uh, my action over there. And so uh, instead of, you know, before what I was doing in the 3D case, I was swapping configuration for momentum. And here, what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to do halfway. I'm not going to swap everything at once. I'm, going to I'm not going to exchange momentum for configuration. What I'm going to do is that I'm just going to exchange half, or I'm going to do a partial Fourier transform, a partial change of polarization, if you wish. And this is achieved by doing uh, an integration by part. OK, so here there is, there is a, a covariant derivative over there. And I'm going to put the covariant derivative on the sigma instead. So I get a boundary term, which is kind of the guy that leads me to this uh, change of, um, you know, that's a boundary term you get by, uh, you know, just by doing integration by part. Obviously, the, this action and this action are the same up to the boundary term. So uh, I mean, boundary term is not going to change the equation of motion. But the, the cool thing is that now we had, a, here there was a BF theory, and now this became something of the uh, BFCG type. So this is like the action I was uh, talking before, which has, which is really has a nice uh, two group uh, theories. So let's get back to what we call uh, X and what we call P, configuration momentum. If you deal with a normal BF approach, you know, you have B delta A and sigma delta E. And so that's because the configuration variable is going to be the full A, the full connection. But now when I do this, change of uh, polarization, essentially now it means that I'm going to have, uh, you know, delta A as configuration, but I also get a sigma. So now my configuration variables are basically A and sigma. It's not A and E anymore. And sigma is a two form. So this means that now I'm really dealing with a two gauge uh, theory as a configuration space. And then the momentum variable is basically E and B. And it's also some type of two gauge theory, right? It's a pair with a connection and, um, and the two form. So if you just focus on the two gauge theory, you see that here it's f is equal to zero, so it's a triviality map, right? And then I got that the two, uh, the two curvature is actually equal to zero. If I look at this guy, oh, but this guy, you see it's supposed to be, you know, E is supposed to be the connection, but then, oh, I also have some A. But that's because, again, that's just for the Chan Simon case, you know, I got this action, so I got a kickback from, um, I, or not a kickback, I have a, an action of SO, on the, on the translational sector. So that's why I, I define my, um, cur my curvature in the sector um, with such a covariant derivative. And then the similar thing, you know, I have because of this action, I also have a contribution uh, for the two curvature in this dual gauge theory. So what about uh, if I deform? So instead, if I'm dealing with a D sector case, SO41 or SO31, in this case, I can again go to the Iwasawa sector. Okay, I'm going to decompose things into the Iwasawa sector. So I'm going to have A in SO, E in AN. Once again, E is a kind of an abuse of notation. It would be really E if I'm dealing with um, AN3, so the D-sector case. 
And so then I can decompose my big, um, my big curvature in SU, uh, SO sector and AN sector. And because I got a bow tie, now the construction is symmetric, right? This is exactly the same curvature that I had before, right? That's a curvature is based on kind of A on the SU2 sector and the curvature based on AN, uh, based on E on the AN sector. We, each time I got a kickback of the other guy. So it's totally symmetric. And so I could do the BF, you know, the usual BF uh, formulation. So that's the, the, my connection is just this guy. But then I can do, I can add a bonar item, I can change polarization. And then in this case, I'm going to deal with a two gauge theory, A sigma. And once again, now uh, this guy is, is kind of more complicated than before. That's because I got the kickback. Okay, so that's why I think it was kind of uh, not realized before that this could be seen as a two gauge theory. That's because we have this kind of uh, back action that probably that's popping up. It's really a pair of two, we have a pair of two gauge theories, non trivial two gauge theories now. So we are kind of looking at that this time with Matteo and uh, Peter. And then you could say, oh, but what about, you know, um, if you add a, a, a potential to this uh, BF action? So the potential is not going to really affect, um, if it doesn't have derivatives, it's not going to affect uh, this kind of uh, discussion about the symplectic potential, what is, what are the configuration variables and so on. So usually we take something of the BB type, but what I first would say, yeah, I would say, yeah, that we should look at that, but first, you know, in fact, it's enough to look at these cases for, for the gravity, uh, the Poincare case or the, um, the Dissitor case, because both of these actions just with, uh, oops, uh, BF, uh, type of action are enough to get both the flat gravity case or the curve case with a cosmological constant here. So for gravity purposes, it may be first it's enough to focus on these guys. And then of course we can look at this type of action, maybe the action by Laurent and Artem, you know, there is more work to do. This, yeah, much more work to do. Okay, so there is the secret is that is, there is this hidden uh, two gauge theory uh, in the BF theories. So, um, what are the lessons? So, uh, you know, I mean, that's the first one is that it is important, you know, what we call what is important for the discretization. Because so you can say, you know, I, I can discretize BF theory as saying, you know, my configuration variable is that. Or I can, now I'm telling you, I can also discretize it uh, in this way by uh, having um, a two gauge uh, connection as configuration space instead. And the result, the discretization is gonna be very different, right? In one case, we're gonna have some kind of uh, uh, spin networks. In the other case, we're gonna have like two spin networks of so decorations, you know, both on um, links and uh, faces. And that's exactly the same thing as before, you know, if you, uh, what we call configuration or what we call momentum matters. And here, what I did to go from here to here, I did the semi-dualization, I exchanged uh, E for sigma. Okay, so what I call momentum, what I call configuration matters when you build your quantum states or when you discretize this kind of uh, intertwined, the same thing. The second lesson is that when you, are, you actually discretize, so you want to keep, you know, you have in mind gravity, obviously I have in mind gravity at least, uh, and so I'm doing a BF theory, I want to, you know, try to get a quantum, uh, quantum gravity model, some spin forms, so I want to implement simplicity constraints, and I would like to say that we have to be actually very uh, careful about the simplicity constraints when you discretize uh, BF as a two-gauge theory. So here I'm going to focus on this case. I think it's the same, exactly the same discretization would apply for that. But I'm, I'm focusing on this case where, which is relevant for building uh, um, the gravity, um, uh, a gravity model, quantum gravity model. So uh, we, I'm going to discretize. Uh, uh, I'm going to discretize the model. So this means that I, I want to uh, identify what are the discrete uh, variables, um, the relevant discrete variables. For that, I'm starting from the potential, the symplectic potential. And uh, I'm going to follow some, uh, you know, recipe some steps. This is exactly the same method that I used uh, to derive, for example, in the 3D context, the quantum group structures. 
So it's, I think it's a good uh, working um, approach. So what do we do? So we start from the potential and then we're gonna go on shell. So you know that here my configuration variables are uh, A and Sigma. So I'm really in the two gauge polarization. So I'm gonna go on shell. So this means if I'm going on shell, it means that the big connection and the big B are basically uh, essentially flat, right? They are zero. So this is kind of, uh, they are pure gauge. I can I just go on a pure gauge. And then I can, I'm, what I'm doing is that I'm decomposing these guys uh, in terms of, you know, the subcomponents for the Lorentz and the translation. This H here is just some kind of holonomy that goes from, um, um, from the center of the tetrahedron to some point X in the tetrahedron. So what I did here, sorry, maybe I should have skipped a step, is that I started from the potential and then uh, the potential is integrated over the full spatial manifold. And uh, what I, I decompose this um, manifold, spatial manifold, into you know, a through a triangulation, and that's my tetrahedra here. And each tetrahedra has um, a point at which I call center, so that's a point in the tetrahedron. Um, and uh, what I'm doing is that uh, when I go on shell, I'm saying, okay, you know, each uh, of these. Um, a uh, field is going to be like a is pure gauge and it's parameterized by such a uh, connection. So I have translational type and um, the gauge type. So as I said before, I'm uh, decomposing these big guys into the subcomponents in the SO and um, uh, translational sector. And then I get, you know, um, an expression when I just replace. And what's nice is that this, um, this is, is, is actually an exact form, right? So this is an exact form. So this means that I can actually perform uh, the, um, uh, the integration. I can use stock theorem. I can go to the boundary of my tetrahedron. So first this was, uh, this was a form inside the tetrahedron. Uh, and then I can go to the boundary. Actually it's an exact, it should be uh, an exact, uh, the exact free form, my bad. So we can go on the boundary. And when I perform this, when I use a stock theorem, so I want to remove a D, right? So I have a D here, a D here, a big D here, and each of these. So I can remove a D essentially. But uh, how I, where I remove this D matters. And so uh, if I use, when I remove the D, if I use this approach, you see that um, I keep the D on this guy. Then what we're going to recover is a normal discretization of BF theory. So we're going to recover T star of G. And the, the difference uh, is essentially in this case. And you see that's similar to what I was saying before, is what I call, you know, what, what is the delta? Is it delta on C or on sigma? And so here it's um, this, the same thing is kind of played by the role of D. Where do I keep the D? Do I keep the D on C or do I keep the D on delta sigma? And where I keep it is going to give, uh, you know, either rise to the normal discretization of BF theory or to a dual, um, to uh, another discretization, which would be a two gauge discretization. So I got this symplectic potential for each uh, tetrahedron. Okay, I got this guy for this one, but I have a similar one for, um, for this other tetrahedron. This, each, you know, these this two tetrahedra share a face. And so the fields that I'm using, you know, they should have the same value whether I'm looking from this side or on this side. So there should be some kind of continuity equation when I move from one uh, tetrahedron to another one. And so this, um, uh, this continuity equation imp imp um, imply some relation between the variables I'm using here and the variables I'm using here. And so this is basically you know, the relations between the, the different types of variables. And then I can argue also, oh, but look, what I could do is that I can, I could concatenate and I could go around a loop. I could put many, many tetrahedra together and, and do a closed loop. Then still things should be consistent, and especially when I come back. And so then that would be, um, you know, the, I would get such, um, um, such uh, you know, such conditions on my field 
where this HE just the, the only limit that you get by going all around this bunch of uh, around this loop. So uh, what I'm saying is that the fields in one tetrahedron are related to the, the field to the other tetrahedron, to the other tetrahedron which is shared by a phase. So you can use that to simplify the expression. So if I'm looking just at the phase, uh, the contribution given by, uh, you know, these two tetrahedra where I would share this phase, then I can express my uh, symplectic potential in a, you know, in a more compact way using these variables that I introduced before, where H is kind of a constant, HCC prime is a constant, this guy is also a constant, this guy is uh, zeta over sigma is a function, and so on. So when, uh, you know, I, I simplify things, and what do I get? I get this type of expression. So this expression is nice because this guy is a constant. So this means that the integral is just on this piece. So I could say, oh, but maybe this looks like my B field. That's going to be the decoration on the, on the face. But I also have some contribution here. So this is a function, this is a function, so, but I can move, you know, I can use a bracket, put it on the other way. This guy is a constant, so I can also maybe integrate uh, you know, put this guy just um, together and integrate it, that would be fine. What about this guy? So, um, this guy, even though there is a D uh, here, you know, I could go to the boundary of the face. So, essentially, the triangle uh, that is shared by these two guys. But then here, this is a function and this is a function. So, that's still a kind of a, you know, I don't have like a constant term that appear. So, more, works, more work is required for that. And so, for example, if we focus just for on one um, one edge, the triangle, then we can do a loop. And here, for simplicity, we just took a loop uh, which has uh, three uh, sides. Uh, then you you can say that you can say that by f due to the continuity equations, this uh, this contribution that uh, that was kind of bothering us uh, can be expressed into three components. So. Uh, let me focus first on the easy components. Uh, this guy is a constant, so this means that the integral can just be on this guy. So that's nice, it's going to be good looking. And what's interesting, you notice that this guy is one of similar to this guy, so this means that this contribution is going to contribute to this expression. So this makes, this means that what we call uh, the object that is going to be associated with um, the triangle equation is going to be very complicated. And similarly for this guy, this guy is a constant, these guys can be integrated over, and I can, again, this guy, I can also put it in this, in such contribution for what will be living on the triangle. And then I'm left with that. So what, what do I do with this expression? So then I look again at the, at the continuity equations. And so when I do the continuity equation for um, uh, a sigma free, I see that essentially, the D of this expression pops up. So this, this expression is a derivative of this one. And so this expression is just obtained by saying, you know, I'm going to move my sigma field, you know, all around, and I'm going to require that when I come back, it has to be the same. And so if we impose this, then this means that, um, uh, this, means that this, ex uh, this expression here is actually uh, constant. And since it's a derivative, you know, I can actually, uh, it's pretty easy, you can integrate that, so it's good. So it's going to be, sorry, this expression is going to be zero, and since it's a derivative, it means that uh, uh, the expression that was bothering us here uh, is going to be uh, a constant. This is an expression that's going to decorate the dual uh, faces. So when you perform that, you know, you finish, you, you do, uh, um, all the calculations, I apologize, maybe it was a bit uh, too technical. But the bottom line is that you recover exactly the phase space that was introduced by, uh, by, uh, by us. So uh, Aldo, uh, Peter, uh, Seth, and Bianca, and myself. And so what you, in this case, you, you really recover that, you know, you have the links which are decorated by SO elements. Um, the, um, uh, faces which are decorated by such uh, elements, so of our four elements, and then you have the B field, um, the discretized B, which is on the triangle, the face of the triangles, but now you also have decorations 
on the edges. Okay, so that's very nice. So the key point is that you also have the question on the edges now. You have these four uh, objects which are decorated. Um, and so also from the construction, you can get that, you know, you have all the uh, bunch of constraints which generate the relevant symmetries. For example, you, the, so the length information is included in the C field. And this length information, you know, you can show that, you know, if you do the, if you have to choose a proper reference frame, so that's why there are H's around, you have to put things on the properly, I mean, or put write things in the proper reference frame, but you can show that the, the triangles, uh, they're actually close. Uh, there is also um, a similar constraints for the faces, the dual faces. So there's going to be a flatness constraint. You're also going to say that you can uh, see that the, the the, the decoration on the dual faces, you know, they can have a, a dual, uh, sorry, a, a tool on the middle that's going to close. It's going to be flat. And then you also have um, the Gauss constraint. And the Gauss constraint is actually involving B field, so that's a discretized B, but then it's got extra terms. So you have some edge information, so this is about the edge, and this is about um, the dual face. So the Gauss constraint is very non-trivial. And that's because the B field, the discretized B is actually a mashed up of everything that can, you can have essentially. And so when you want to, uh, you know, implement the simplicity constraint, which was initially, you know, in the, in the, normal, in the normal case, it's, uh, that would be just this piece. And so it's kind of enough to work, you know, to implement the simplicity constraint, it's just enough to work on this piece. And, the discrete information is kind of equivalent to the continuum information. And now we have all these crazy uh, combinations. And so I think that to implement the simplicity constraint in this context is much more important. Okay, so that's, that was a bit longer than expected. Uh, but so then the question is, how can you uh, ex try to extend that to the, uh, to the curve case? So discretizing the action and simplicity potential and so on is kind of work in progress. Uh, but we can actually try to guess what's going on um, and try to build by hand the discrete phase space. So what did we do before? So this would be typically the uh, BF type of discretization. So in the BF type of discretization, you only get um, the question on the links and uh, the question on the dual faces, and that's they have to be flat, right? From the equal Newton argument. And then what I did here is that uh, I um, exchanged, so I swapped, I swapped some guys. So I said, oh, you know, this AN piece, this AN piece is gonna go there, and I'm gonna send this, um, oh, sorry, I was in the flat case, but what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna put this AN over there. That's kind of the semi dualization that I was mentioning before. So to have uh, more insights on uh, uh, what's going on here, I want to talk about the circle of life or group. It's coming from a poisson to quantum. For the people who speak, don't speak French, poisson is like fish, so you know, since we come from fish, so this was relevant. So let's start from a poisson group. A poisson group is um, a, 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 a Lie group, uh, which is equipped with a poisson bracket, such that the, the group product is compatible with the poisson bracket. Um, what I can do then, is that I can go to the infinitesimal limit. And then in this case, I would deal with uh, what is called a Lie by algebra. So the, the Poisson bracket is going to go to the, this guy, which is a cross cycle. And, uh, you know, the group has, you know, Lie algebra vector space equipped with a bracket, Lie bracket. So the Lie algebra is there, the, or the Lie by algebra is there, because it's got a cross cycle, you know, it's feel, it feels uh, lonely, so it's going to pair up with its dual. It's going to generate a dual. So I'm going to construct a dual of, of that. And what's happening is that the delta, the co-cycle, is going to give me the Lie bracket of the dual uh, Lie algebra, Lie by algebra. And this uh, bracket is going to become the co-cycle for this dual guy. And so if now if you, you can put them together to form what is called a double. And then, you know, you put, it's like a cell, you have two cells, and then up it's, it's exponential, right? So you're going to exponentiate that. If you exponentiate that, there is a way, in some cases, provided things are okay, 
I'm a bit sloppy, I apologize for the mathematicians, but there is a way to construct uh, a phase space. This is called uh, Eisenberg double. And you know, once you have this Eisenberg double, then or, which is a phase space, then when you have a phase space, you can say, okay, I'm going to choose a polarization, it can be G or G star, whatever. Then let's say G, it can be configuration, I can quantize that. And then you're going to get a point quantization if you have a non-trivial Poisson bracket on G, right? So if the Poisson bracket is not zero, then upon quantization, you're going to get you know, uh, the matrix elements, for example, of uh, the group to be non-commutative. And that's, you know, that's what we call a quantum group. And then you can take a classical limit and, you know, and then uh, and, uh, and, uh, starts again. Well, something similar is kind of uh, happening for two groups. Uh, I think it's not, uh, it's not uh, things are not well so studied in general. Uh, but so, uh, for sure, you can define a notion of quantum uh, strict to group. That's what uh, Sean Magic did. Um, and then I'm, I'm not too sure this has been really uh, analyzed in details, but I mean, you can do a classical limit. And then if you do the classical limit, you, you're going to get Poisson strict uh, two groups, which have been actually defined. You see that they're actually been introduced a bit later than what uh, Sean did. Um, then you can go, oh yeah, and what's, so I'm, today I'm going to play with um, uh, Poisson two groups and so on, but I'm going to focus on a very specific case. I'm going to focus on the case where the trivia, uh, the T map is actually trivial. Uh, because in this case, like as, as I said before, the two group behaves essentially as a group. And so things that I just told you about groups basically are going to apply in a very nice manner. So um, uh, we can again close uh, the loop. And so if you have a, a strict two group, a Poisson strict two group, then you can go to the Lie two by algebra. And again, here I'm focusing on the case where the T, the T map is, uh, is trivial. You can find the dual, okay? And then you can put these two guys together. And in this case, you can still have a phase space. And because in a way, you know, the T map is trivial, uh, two group, these two groups I'm looking at are not so far from groups. Really, you know, all the structure I'm using are very similar to the one that I introduced before for groups. What I, I want to emphasize here is that because the T map is trivial, this guy is abelian, the H is abelian, and this G star as well. Okay, so there are, it's like a pair of point carry pieces. So, what uh, can you do, how can you do that? That's the third lesson, is that you probably know Kappa Poincaré, you heard of Kappa Poincaré maybe coming from DSR and so on, but it's what the cool thing is that now Kappa Poincaré is gonna appear as a quantum two group. So how do we do that? So we start, as before, we start from T star of G1 about I G2. Okay, so I'm gonna call uh, these guys, it's an abuse of notation, right? So G1, I'm gonna see the, the the so dual algebra, I'm going to see it as an abelian uh, group. What I can do is that I can go to the infinitesimal uh, limit, so the Lie algebra level over there. And then what I'm going to do is that I'm going to semi-dualize again. Okay, that's this always this semi-dualization. Semi-dualization is kind of a very important thing for Shan Majid. He's, he's constructed his bicross product and so on. So it's a very important thing. And what always confused me is that Shan usually all were, uh, is always working on this guy and then saying, oh, I'm going to semi-dualize this guy, and then I'm going to get this guy. And I was always confused about the meaning of that. Here, if you deal with a full phase space, I think things, for me at least, are much clearer. What do we do here is that we have a phase space, uh, X and P, and what we're going to do is that we're going to do a partial Fourier transform. We're just going to Fourier transform half of it. That's the semi-dualization. So here I'm exchanging G2 and G2 star. Okay, I'm just doing a partial uh, Fourier transform. And then you can exponentiate back. So that's kind of a semi-dualization, uh, how the semi-dualization is going to work. And now I can, you see that because this guy is abelian, this guy is also abelian, I can interpret this guy essentially as two groups. While basically they are group, you know, in a way, but uh, because the team map is trivial, you know, I can, we can interpret them as two groups. And if you deal with this construction with the Lorentz group or the Decitor group, that's how exactly this approach is exactly how you generate the Kappa Poincaré structure. So 
So you have kappa Poincaré, the Poisson group, or the kappa Poincaré um, algebra. And so uh, now what I want to do is to want to say, you see, I'm going to interpret this guy as a two group and the two group and this guy as another two group, and I'm going to use them to discrete us to construct the phase space. So we're going to take this uh, phase space and um, we're going to glue it to construct a big phase space for a big uh, triangulation. So um, I, that's my phase space. And like I said, uh, even though there are groups, right, uh, it's uh, Eisenberg double, I'm going to interpret them as two groups. So when I'm going to decorate things, I'm going to decorate them. So the G1 is, is going to be on the links and the G2 star is going to be on the faces, the dual faces. G2 is going to decorate the edges and G1 star is going to decorate the triangles. So that's, um, so, and we're dealing with half links. We can also deal with half edges, but for simplicity, we just dealt with um, edges directly. And so now what, this is kind of the atomic piece. And what we're going to do now is that we're going to glue these pieces to generate a full triangulation and a complex, and a dual complex. So to generate this triangulation, what we're going to do is that we're going to identify stuff usually. So we're going to, when we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to identify some edges, for example, to glue wedges. Uh, identification, to say it's identified, it's a constraint. But if it's a constraint, then it means, you know, it's generating a symmetry. And that's how, what we're going to do is that we're going to use symplectic reduction. So symplectic reduction is, you know, how to uh, get a phase space when you have symmetry. So you have uh, some, a big phase space, then you have a symmetry, some symmetry which is generated by a constraint, and, the question, and you can reconstruct a new phase space out of that using symplectic reduction. So you can identify stuff, you know, to glue things. So when you identify things, you are gluing the dual variable, or fusing it. And then obviously we also have to use closure constraints, which also implement symmetry transformation. So they're also included in the symplectic reduction of this. So for, uh, that's a list of gluing that we uh, do, for example. So if we want to glue links, okay, links are dual to triangles, right? So this means that we need to identify um, the, um, the triangle uh, decorations. And uh, so, yeah, so we identify, we have to do some, because it's a phase decoration, we have to be careful with the roots and so on. And so by uh, such constraint, we can, you know, uh, build a big uh, link. We can, wait, uh, we can glue wedges. Uh, there are different ways to glue wedges. Here they are basically glued uh, along the long way, but you could obviously glue them, you know, if there is an opposite one over there, you could also glue it that way. Each time you have to, you know, do the proper, um, um, proper choice of route and so on, you have to be careful about that. And uh, Matteo was very careful with this type of things. Uh, so we can also glue uh, faces or so triangles. Um, yeah, to glue faces in this way. So we, what we are doing is that we are identifying the links. And then we can also glue uh, edges or fuse uh, edges. Okay, so these are the type of uh, um, gluing that we can do and the, all those are induced by constraints. And so uh, then uh, the, um, uh, you know, we can use symplectic reduction. So here in this, I just wanted to first to, to show you the case of the, of the triangle. So we take three phase space, three atomic phase spaces. And then what we're going to do is that we're going to identify this link and this link, which is going to merge these two guys. And then we're going to identify this link with that. And then, so that's the three guys. Oops. The three guys are going to be um, uh, merged. And then we have to demand for the closure constraint of the edges. Okay, so that's uh, the symmetry that we're going to implement and that we, that's just, we're going to do the reduction with respect to this type of symmetry. You can do the same for if you want to build a tetrahedron or even if you want to build um, uh, the boundary of a force simplex. So then you, you repeat that and you get at the end a big phase space. You know, uh, by uh, gluing triangles, you triangles you glue, you glue in simplices and then uh, tetrahedra, and then you use uh, you glue these tetrahedra together, and so like that you build a big phase space which has decorations on you know faces, dual faces, uh, links, and edges. 
And this construction matches with the construction uh, that we got when we they were dealing with the Poincaré case. So time is up. Uh, just uh, what I want to, to say is that uh, I want to emphasize the fact that we have four scales a priori to play with. Um, so we have the scale, usually, you know, we see that there is LP. So if it's a scale, um, um, this LP scale is kind of the curvature. So usually, you know, in the LQG picture, we have SU2 here. So SU2 is the curve. So uh, then it means that dually we're going to get a non commutative scale. So dually that's on the, on the triangle. So LP is going to be encoding the non commutativity for the triangle, that's the flux non commutative algebra. But here now we can put curvature on these three on the four spots, and possibly if we do, um, if we implement simplistic constraints, hopefully maybe that's going to reduce to two. Um, and also, what I would like to say is that um, what we are doing here is, I think, a different representation, uh, just like for the free gravity. Uh, for 3D gravity, you know, you can, you know, discretize things, you know, with using Chan Simon, this SU2 piece, or this LQG star. And, uh, you know, it's different way to describe the same thing. At the end of the day, we're always looking at the same theory. It's just that the choice of quantum states are very different, but then at the end of the day, it's the same theory. So there must be some relation between all these states that we are considering. For example, and in 3D, I know that there is this uh, uh, work with, Sorry, Karim, uh, uh, Laurent, Karim, and um, Philippe Roche, where they show that there are six J symbols which are kind of defined either for SU2 representation or for uh, certain non, non, kind of non commutative R3, and there are some relations between the two. So um, I think that's a hint that there, is, there must be a relation between these states. And I think that then something similar must apply here. We can either use spin networks based on the big group. If we don't if we did with PF or these two spin networks, there must be, um, uh, I think there must be a relation because we are actually doing all of the same thing, right? And so if you really want to do something else, then since this talk is actually hosted in Lyon, although virtually, I just wanted to say that um, maybe we want to go away from two groups and uh, we can maybe talk about weak two groups, uh, but I don't think weak two groups are probably. I don't know if there's a right object, but there is some work done by uh, Jean-Michel, uh, Jean-Michel Maillet back in the days, where he actually, and Laurent actually, I think it's one of his first papers, um, where they actually thought that maybe, you know, uh, put some decoration on the faces. And in their work, this uh, decoration on the face was actually uh, the R matrix. But really what, uh, what I liked in their approach is the following thing. If you deal with the two group, you see that you know we transport the G2 in terms of G1, and it's just an action on the uh, on the left here, right? And this is just this index that is uh, matched with this one. This index is not touched at all, so it's very restrictive. What I liked in the uh, what uh, Jean-Michel and Jean-Michel and his collaborators were doing is that now you know we can actually try to define a map where all the indices are, are changed. So now we have maybe more uh, more room, more or maybe to implement the flat, the simplicity constraints or things like that. Okay, so the final lesson, since my time is up, um, is I think that two groups, you know, provide maybe a new new window to discuss a quantum gravity model, a new a new type of uh, spin forms. And uh, here it's very, I thought it was very nice that the notion of kappa Poincaré uh, space was recovered, but now as a two group uh, structure. And um, so now we are kind of looking at these cases, and I think that this case is also very interesting because we could uh, really revisit this case and in light of what uh, Mark and his collaborators have been, um, have been doing and see whether you know, there's some, some application. Maybe, we could, I mean, uh, my hope would be that there is a, a new way to implement the simplicity constraints in this context in the two group uh, picture starting from a complex which has decoration on edges and uh, faces. Um, and if we put a potential, like a BB term, probably then uh, instead of dealing with a two group which has a T-map trivial, maybe it would be a, a non-trivial T-map. I think that's what um, we're discussing with um, Aldo. 
And also, I should say that, unfortunately, there is not much known for the representation theory of two groups. So there is a big paper by Laurent, Aristide, and John Baez, and Derek Weiss. Uh, but things like such as the Peter Weil theorem is not um, is not known, and so I'm um, I'm hoping that uh, because here we have two, we have geometry that is guiding us. We could hope to define this uh, notion of Fourier transform, and we are actually kind of um, uh, working in this in this line using a, a two group uh, field theory. And so all this is very new. Uh, it's, it's very recent work, so. Um, you know, um, there are a lot of things I think to do and uh, many things that actually I don't know how, how they work, uh, but I think it's a lot of um, interesting stuff ahead. Thank you very much and I apologize for being a bit uh, too long. Thank you. Thanks, Florian. So we have time for some questions. So I have one in case uh, because so at the end you mentioned um, the a possible deformation with the uh, BB type terms. Yeah. So and also you also mentioned at some point the comment by Baez and Huerta uh, related to the deformation and the cosmological constant. Yes. So here you're, you're basically here going away from what we usually naively think, namely that the deformation is related to the cosmological constant. Because so that's um, that's actually something I was talking with Aldo the other day, and it's a bit um, uh, I'm a bit confused about that. Like I said, um, sorry, we have actually four scales to put here in the game. You know, just just you know thinking about that. This lambda it came from the curvature from the curvature from the internal Lie algebra. So this lambda comes from so for one, that's a lambda that comes so because I'm, I'm I'm using a bigger group. Uh, this LP here co would come from the SO3, SO31, or SU2. I mean, uh, if you do um, uh, time uh, time gauge or things like that, would, this guy would break down to SU2. So this would be that, and then we are left with that. Um, so what's um, what are those guys? I mean, uh, is it that really I can have two terms, you know, a BB and a sigma sigma? So each of those will have a um, will have a cosmological term. I don't know. So this is kind of I don't know. Here it's pure conjecture. I, I didn't really know. I didn't have time to look at that. You see, there is no classical gravity interpretation of these terms already, just classically uh, without discretizing and quantizing. And uh, so I didn't study. Uh, I didn't study yet BF plus BB with the sitter, with the, the sitter group. I didn't, I didn't check what, what was going on for this guy. What uh, I'm hoping and what we were discussing with Ido was that maybe when we put the simplicity constraints, so we start to put things in relation, then we some scales have to match. And so then we reduce the number of scales. Um, but there is indeed a clash. So usually we say that the, the, so the lambda that comes from in front of BB is the guy that becomes a cosmological constant. And here I said, oh no, in my model, I don't have to do that. I can just get it from looking at the bigger Lie algebra. So lambda seems to be coming from, or could be coming from two, two ways, either from this, this guy or from a bigger Lie algebra. And, um, so then, I mean, I don't know. I, I, like I said, it's very new, so I don't know. I mean, um, I think maybe I know. I think since I know worked a bit on that, maybe I know. In fact, I know has a, he's raising his hand. So. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm raising my hand. I think for 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 different reasons. So right now, I, I'm I'm not sure I can I can say anything intelligent about that. So. Do you want to finish your discussion, or but I have a, a remark and a question. Go ahead. Well, I think, well, uh, I think uh, like I said, uh, for a mark, I, I don't have much more to say. That there are four yeah. steps uh, in the game, and then probably um, 
hopefully by imposing geometricity and stuff, we can kind of reduce those, you know, by saying, you know, this case, the, the decoration should be related. Um, yeah. Okay. Hello. Thank you. Uh, Florian, it was a very nice talk, a very thought provoking. I think you see some deep things uh, going on there. Very nice. So I have one uh, question, and that is when you change your polarization, then somehow you produce a boundary term. Yeah. And so um, although altogether we, we, um, we have the same uh, theory, there should also be something uh, different happening when a boundary is there. And then potentially your theory, your two gauge theory interacting with uh, stuff on the boundary. I was just wondering if you have some ideas about that or some further thoughts that would be my question and and the remark would just be that i was just very intrigued about you connecting the um, two gauge theory and uh, quantum groups because um, i think in the in this old way we do the isolated horizon um, my uh, student thomas silker um, has observed that it's actually the, the isolated horizon condition actually says that um, the canonical variables form a two connection on the horizon. And then also in the quantum theory, we get a trans-Simons theory, which is ruled by the, the quantum group. So um, I thought this was very nice that you can actually somehow tie these things together. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, in 3D, um, well, for the quantum, uh, so you're saying because I'm getting kind of some kind of quantum group also popping up, that's what you're saying? Right, right, exactly, because you, I, I think in the last part, I, I, I saw that you were making a connection between a two group yeah. uh, with right. a Poisson yeah. bracket and a, and a quantum, uh, a quantum yeah. group, yes. Um, what was the first the actual question was uh, my actual question was uh, if you have any idea of how this boundary term uh, will manifest itself when you do this uh, this um, formulation where you have sort of manifest uh, two group symmetries in the presence of a boundary so the, the i see the boundary term as a way to map one um, one action to another one so we can say oh we have a b b f plus t sigma or an action which is bf plus e d a sigma mm -hmm. okay this one is if you discretize that is going to be a, a so the normal spin network uh, construction if you oops sorry and if you discretize instead this guy you're going to get the two gauge picture. The relation between the two, uh, the relation between the two is given by this uh, boundary term. So the boundary term is a way that connects the two picture, you know, I mean the two actions at least. Um, yeah, I was just wondering the, whether this this thing comes alive somehow, and there's also a theory on the boundary um, that somehow couples to your two gauge theory in the bulk. If you have a boundary, I mean, if fair enough, fair enough. But actually, I, when I discretize, I do have boundaries because I always I mm. decompose my stuff into uh, simplices, and you know, I. I see. Yes. And so, yes. So I don't explicitly play much with this uh, boundary. I, I don't put really a boundary theory, uh, a theory on the boundary. I mean, the only thing that applies here, which is a thing uh, that that came up for Marc, Laurent, and so on, and all these guys studying boundaries is that really the, the, what we, the relevant um, variables are the charges which are on the boundary. I see. And, I see. Uh, and like I was saying before, at, at, um, at the classical level, we are not saying, I mean, the, the charges here are always the same, right? It's always B, we have E, I mean, the sigma, all the, ch the charges you know, are the same. But what we call configuration of momentum changes because when we discretize, then beam these charges that you know they don't have the same status anymore because we are discretizing them on a complex or a dual complex. Oh, dual. Mm -hmm. And so, 
in this way, the boundary charges are kind of discretized in a, in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, but how exactly is this boundary term doing things? Um, actually, I don't know. Um, maybe that's a tool that we need to do what I'm saying, that I said that, you know, spin networks and two spin networks should be related, or like in mm -hmm. uh, gravity, SU2, SU2, look, uh, uh, um, LQG or LQG star should, should be related in a way. Um, maybe that's for this one item. I don't know. Actually, I didn't think of that. Yeah. Could be, uh, I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Daniele has a raised hand. Yeah. Hi, Florian. Thanks. So uh, I have a couple of questions uh, slash comments. So one is, uh, in fact, was related to the to the issue of boundaries and the additional data that you have thanks to the to group structure. I would just uh, I just wanted to know more about the connection with the edge modes, and in particular, if you restrict to the Poincaré case, in the case of the Poincaré group seen you know, as a two group, uh, if you can see that the resulting structure, the richer structure that you need to to encode all the two group is in, are in fact the Poincaré networks uh, suggested by uh, Laurent and Daniel and etc. If you see the connection there, or I'm just making it too simple. That's, that's the first question. Sorry, okay. I asked the oh. second, and then I let you answer. And, and the, 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 the second question I, is, uh, you mentioned that it's very difficult to, we don't know enough about the representation theory of, of the two groups. I, I think I understand that. But I was wondering is if, uh, as, at least in the case of the um, Poincaré group seen as a two group, uh, you can basically get along with the representation theory of the Poincaré group. And no, just reinterpret it as uh, well, or, or, sure from that, the uh, point of view of the two group. Uh, so let's maybe res respond first to this question. Um, this I don't know. I mean, I think um, so. I didn't I didn't dwell too much yet on the representation theory, but I know that uh, Laurent, Steve, and Derek and John Bayes they spent hundreds of pages to define the representation theory of the Poincaré two group. So. Um, I don't, I don't know if it was just at the end of the day the Poincaré representation. I'm, I'm not too sure about that. Um, um, yeah, uh, I'm not too sure. I've, uh, so I, 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 I didn't go yet there. So I, I, I must say I, I'm going to stay cautious. And regarding the Poincaré uh, networks by uh, Laurent and collaborators. Um, unfortunately, I actually don't know either if there is a relation. Um, I, we didn't look at that yet. As I said, this this kind of work is is pretty recent. We didn't have time to do much uh, much things. Um, I I I I think that dealing with the normal, probably normal BF. So by normal, I mean the Lorentz case just the Lorentz case and somehow they are able to extract out of that uh, some Poincaré, some, I think some 3D Poincaré, um, so 3D Poincaré networks. Uh, like I said before, we can do um, the discretization that we did before can be done also with the Poincaré group, so the 3D Poincaré group. Uh, but that's, that would be a different kind of a different starting, a diff oops. Uh, uh, there would be a different starting point in a way. Okay, so I could uh, do, I could start from that, discretize that. I could get, so uh, if I was discretizing that, I would get some BF, uh, Poincare BF um, spin networks. And then I could also discretize them as, oops, uh, as, um, as that. Sorry. Screens. I could also, discretize them, these guys as a two group in a two group way. Uh, but that would be a bit different than what they do because they, I think they probably do simplicity, um, well, simplicity constraint, they do time gauge and so on. So uh, there's much more work to do, I would say. If I understand the, the difference would be that uh, if you just use it as a Poincaré group, you would discretize all on the same uh, combinatorial structure just with a standard uh, set of data, but uh, you wouldn't put uh, different uh, components of the Poincaré connection in different uh, uh, parts of the 
uh, if you do Poincaré Pierre. Yes. So here, this this guy is kind of a flattened notion. Is you know, you can start from SO3 one, and you flatten the boost. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so so you could discretize this and then flatten the boost, and you will get a 3D Poincaré BF uh, theory. And, and you could discretize that, you would get spin networks based on 3D, uh, on this 3D Poincaré case. Um, uh, but but well, I think yeah, it's, it's not, obviously it's not that what they do, but they do something much more uh, involved where they do a lot of steps. And so I, I think what we have to do really is to consider BF uh, defined on the Lorentz group, like I was saying, do this semi dualization to go to the two group picture and then there now let's do the steps you know all the steps that people usually do so see what is the simplicity constant and i think i will predict our i had up and down for that um <clears throat> because in fact this analysis uh splitting up so free one into sub parts is exact is exactly what uh, mark and, uh, and laurent are doing but they are doing it mark and daniel uh, and laurent so they are doing it in the um, carton basis. They are using boost, and here I don't, I don't, I don't do it this way. I do it in the AN basis, and uh, in their their decomposition in the carton basis. I mean, Mark, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but in the carton basis, when they implement the simplicity constraint, it's very beautiful because in their decomposition, you have the the, the rotation piece and the boost piece. And when you're doing the, the simplectic analysis, you see that, oh, but in fact, there is, each of these guys can be already simple in a way. It's just that there are two frames. And the simplicity constraint is just to say that each of these frames are the same. Okay, so it's kind of a linear, a linearized way to implement the simplicity constraint, so which I thought it was very nice. Uh, but when you do this Cartan decomposition, the piece, the boost piece, if you identify it, the two form that you get here is uh, a point simplicity constraint becomes zero. So it drops, and that's why you get just SU2. And so off, and um, uh, you mark, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, right? No, no, yeah, it's correct. Uh, and so uh, then when I saw that, I was wondering, oh, but then uh, it means that if we implement simplicity constraints, you know, we have to get back to SU2 spin network that sucks. No, no, no to gauge here. Uh, so it's, it can still be happening, but the point is that there may be a possible way out is that to have a two gauge theory working, it's not, we're not working with boost. You have to work with the AN thing. So you have to do a change of basis. And this change of basis is kind of mixing up the, the what um, Mark and, um, and collaborators were uh, um, working with. So that you have to mix a bit of rotation and a bit of, a bit of boost to generate the AN. And so again, this means that the simplicity constraint in this case might not be so simple. I mean, so not so simple to implement. And I hope that then in this case, things will not collapse to zero so that we can still have some decorations um, on the faces that will not uh, that will survive. And uh, again, uh, how is this is related to the Poincaré stuff? I, this, uh, I don't know. Let's see. Well, this is pretty new, so um, there are many obvious connections and uh, that have, can be done and with other work, but we didn't have time to do that. Uh, but I'm, I'm really excited because it's really sh trying to do something new with some old stuff, right? We, we're really taking normal BF and we're just seeing it in a very different way now. And um, I hope it can be useful, maybe yes, maybe no. All right, are there more questions? Okay, if not, we can thank uh, Florian again for the very nice talk. Thank you. Thanks, Florian. Attending. <laughs>